this is Intel's first Core i9 processor, the 7900X. It's a 10-core behemoth with hyper-threading for a whopping 20 threads as well as solid overclockability. The CPU is based on 14 nanometer Skylake architecture and utilizes the LGA 2066 socket, the 2011 V3 successor. The motherboard I'm sporting here is the ASRock X299 Tai Chi, a model I've been a huge fan of since the first Tai Chi implementation in X99. You can also find X370 and Z270 variants linked in this video's description. So this video is all about that Core i9. Let's talk first about power consumption and overclockability. Now as a general rule of thumb, the higher the core count, the more difficult it is to push that CPU to a certain frequency. In the case of this particular 7900X unit, I hit a steady 4.6 GHz at 1.25 volts. This mind you with a 240 mm AIO, which is severe underkill for a CPU of this caliber, and a single 8 pin EPS power delivery format. A few in the tech community have pointed out temperature issues along the 8 pin cable when a supplementary 4 or 8 pin are missing. This board only has a single 8 pin and my cable does get very hot around the back, but I don't think that it's to the point where things are gonna, you know, catch fire. It's something we'll dive deeper into in a separate video. And speaking of power, according to Tom's hardware, the i9-7900X draws a whopping 230 watts alone from the wall. That's just the CPU pulling 230 from the wall. That's more than most graphics cards, which are essentially tiny PCs themselves. Tweaked P-states bring idle consumption down to insane low lows, but this is really irrelevant when seen in the context of the CPU's intention to begin with. This is a workhorse costing roughly 1000 USD, and it will liberally consume power as such. Nonetheless, the Tai Chi maintained a solid 4.6 GHz overclocked as mentioned earlier, thanks to its 13-phase power delivery system and solid UEFI. And I must say, this board also looks pretty sweet. I especially love this cool geared chipset heatsink and RGB LED array, integrated Wi-Fi, and overclock support. But the i9's bad news does not stop here, thanks largely in part to Intel's decision to throw some choice garbage thermal interface between the heat spreader and the die of the chip, things get very hot. This is typical Intel by this point, and it's pathetic. They crippled their 76 and 7700Ks with the same Tim approach. Temperatures reached a staggering 93 degrees in Ida 64, approaching T-junction where we'd expect a bit of thermal throttling. At 4.7 GHz in the same voltage, the CPU did thermal throttle almost immediately after starting the test. I should point out that this is due largely in part to the CPU itself and my choice to only go with a 240mm AIO here, not the motherboard. Most motherboards will fare well in this regard, just mind your VRM temperature. Temperatures. All the benchmarks you'll see in this video will be with the CPU clocked to 4.6 GHz, where no thermal throttling occurred. The RAM config was 16 GB of Corsair Dominator Platinum's running in quad channel at 3000 MHz. It's a frequency which was effortless for the Tai Chi, and you expect that, it's an X299 board. The graphics card occupying one of the board's four full length PCIe slots was a reference GTX 1080 Ti from PNY running at stock. For comparison's sake, I also threw in an i7 6700K with the same RAM config just running a dual channel versus quad, and the same GPU, as well as the same 4.6 GHz overclock. So without further ado, the benchmarks. First up, the Cinebench R15 scores. The i7-6700K scored an impressive 1019, despite its four physical cores, but the i9 Giant demolishes the competition with 2,442. That's a 140% increase from that of the smaller counterpart. And check out all those threads working together so well. This is pretty cool feeling right here, just watching this, not gonna lie. With Geekbench 4, the gap narrows significantly, but the i9 still easily wins over. Something else to note, the i7 clock for clock is a slightly more powerful CPU from a single core standpoint, hence the 8% increase at the bottom. But at the end of the day, who really cares? These are just numbers, they don't mean anything. Let's throw these CPUs into a ring in which I'm familiar, that's Adobe Premiere Pro. Rendering the same 5 minute 1080p 60fps file with the YouTube 1080p preset, the i7 finished in just over 4 minutes, whereas the i9 completed the same task in just under under three. Now at this point, if you ask me with price taken into consideration, this margin isn't justified. The law of diminishing returns applies, this isn't optimized for 10 cores, clearly, and core count does matter less and less as you pass about four cores in this case. It will vary from program to program, but for the most part, I would say anywhere between four and eight is your safe zone. So if you want something slightly better than the i7, but for the same price as the i7, then go with Ryzen 7. The 1700 will do you just fine. This isn't a matter of red versus blue, folks. I don't care who is on top. Neither of them pay me. Neither of them even talk to me. I just want satisfactory competition. Remember, don't pay attention to the company. 
pay attention to what the company offers. So now, let's jump into those gaming benchmarks. I tested in 1440p for solid GPU and CPU leveraging, though some would argue that 1080p would be the better choice here, it's more common by the way. I still think that if you're going to pay a thousand bucks for a CPU, you should probably try to bump your resolution up a bit. I think 1440p is probably the bare minimum for how much you're likely to spend on this platform. There's a 1080 Ti in here, remember, so graphics card bottlenecking is relatively minimal. These are settings, by the way, that I'd expect anyone with this kind of PC to opt for in the real world. First up on this list, as always, GTA 5. This game is beautifully optimized and leverages a fair amount of both the central and graphics processors. Don't let anyone tell you this game is not a good port. It really is, and it utilizes resources accordingly. I benchmark in the same settings every single time, so you can carry these over to other videos on the channel as well. You'll find averages here and 0.1% and 1% lows, and I apologize, next time I'll stagger them in descending order, not ascending order. Across the board, the i7-6700K took the cake with consistent margins. With GTA 5, your sweet spot is four physical cores, anything past that, and well, you'll have a few left over for streaming, that's about it. Both frame time charts were extremely consistent too, which is good, save a few spikes here or there, which both CPUs experienced at some point. You'd be fine with either platform in the scenario, likely even when streaming, but the cost of X299 makes it difficult to rationalize a $1000 CPU and roughly $300 motherboard. Doom was a similar story. This is the first time I've benchmarked Doom, by the way. Even in the Ultra preset, the i9 just couldn't keep up. These frame rate differences were actually very consistent with GTA 5, surprisingly, though Doom is slightly more demanding all around. By the way, I intend to run a few Vulcan tests with this game very soon. I love how it leverages resources, and I'd be interested to see how AMD fares into this mix. Now let's compare a physics-intensive scenario in 3D Mark Fire Strike. Most of these calculations are unloaded on the CPU. Predictive pathways, particle collisions, explosions, all of these will utilize CPU threads to a solid extent, and in this case the i9 crushes its competition hands down. More cores, more frames, for something like this anyway. Wouldn't it be nice if all games worked this way? Well, maybe not, since most gamers still rely on two or four physical cores. Wouldn't make much sense to cripple a majority in favor of a minority from a developer standpoint, now would it? Utilitarianism for the win. Up next is Universe Sandbox 2. I love this game, it's beautiful, we can do anything you want practically and it crushes CPUs. Click this card right here for an example of that. So how does a 10-core CPU fare? Well, not well. Actually worse than the 4-core counterpart, which I find difficult to believe given that these frequencies were identical. Hmm, I'll hit up the developers on this one. CPU utilization is fairly high and consistent across all 20 threads too, which is a good sign. More on this in a separate video. The last benchmark on our list is Witcher 3. Okay. This game is extremely GPU intensive. What does that mean? It's not gonna matter as much what kind of CPU we have in our system as long as it's not some single core processor from 2002, we should be, you know, okay, that's an exaggeration, but you see my point. Switching from an i5 to an i7 to an i9 shouldn't matter too much in this regard because it's really our GPU that matters. But I spoke too soon. The i7 still pulls ahead here, which is strange because the i5-7600K actually performs almost as well in this game as the i7 counterpart. So this is a bit ridiculous if you ask me. Sure, average frame rates were neck and neck, but for the smooth gameplay, 1% and 0.1% lows reveal a different story. Your best bet in this case is without a doubt the i7, not the i9. Again. Frame time graphs confirm this of course. Things were a bit scattered here for the i7, remember we want smooth lines low on the y axis, but this i9, my oh my, all over the place. And that's where I'm going to end this video. If you're a gamer, don't buy the i9. Like, I don't know why you would, but just to say you have it, that's really all I can conjure from this whole thing is if you want the i9 to say you've got a 10 core overclockable processor, I guess you can spend a thousand bucks. I mean, to give the CPU the benefit of the doubt, it is $600 cheaper than the 6950X 10 core processor from the previous generation. So Intel did lower the price significantly, it's worth noting, but still a thousand bucks for a CPU, especially in a rig that's gonna be primarily used for gaming, is downright ridiculous. Now if you want to stream, go with Ryzen at this point, better bang for the buck. But this, this is just unacceptable. Content creators should also look elsewhere. The i7-6700K serves me well, but so has the Ryzen 1700X. It just comes down to bang for the buck, and from what I can see, the i9 is not an option. In fact, it's just a money pit. 
It's a hot money pit. Be sure to give this video a thumbs up if you thought it was cool. I stayed up all night to make this video. I was running benchmarks like 24-7. It's actually daytime again. So if you have a sympathy thumbs up for me, I'd appreciate it. Thumbs down if you feel the complete opposite about the whole video or if you hate everything about life. Be sure to click the subscribe button if you haven't already and I'll catch you in the next video. Some super cool stuff just made its way through the door. So uh, stay tuned for that video. This is Science Studio. Thanks for learning with us.